a half an inch that my heart didn't smite me. Amen. Never had that desire to do right. And the minute you feel, whatever it is, you say something wrong, unkind, that rises up. That's not Christ. You know it's not. And the heart smites you. I told the testimony. I was running a drilling rig. Had five men working for me. And we got out there that night. They are half drunk when I picked them up. But I didn't say anything. The only reason I wasn't, I've just got saved. And now we're out there, 2 o'clock in the morning, eight, ten thousand 10,000 feet deep. Great danger. There's pressure down there. you got to watch that mud. The viscosity must be kept flowing. But the weight must be kept to keep that from blowing out. I looked out there. That man in charge of that, the Derek man, is asleep on the boardwalk. I put a weight on that brake and went down, and I kicked him. Oh, I kicked him. Amen. He jumped straight up. I said, let me tell you something, boy. Either watch this mud or go home. You understand me? Clear. Well, I went back up. The devil said, you ain't safe. And nobody goes around kicking people to save. Well, I had such hope because I did want to change. I got a little boy just four months old. I don't want him to be what I was. I don't want that. And I thought, no, I, I, I fooled myself. And I've never been so grieved. I'm sitting there watching old Martin Decker indicator. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, Son, this is the first time in your life you ever felt bad about kicking anybody. Oh, that heart was right. Yes, sir. Never kicked anybody since. But that heart rose up. That heart, you see, that's, that was perfected. I wasn't, and 40-something years later, still not. But that heart has been perfected, Amen. I want to read tonight, first of all, in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. The 8th chapter of the Gospel of John in verse number 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Chapter 8 and verse 1. There is... Therefore, now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Many times in quoting verses, we cut them off where we, uh, where we want to cut them off. It's kind of strange how that we take parts of scriptures. You know, we take the scripture says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But that's not all that says. It said, and they love not their lives unto death. But somehow, that's always kind of left off. And in this 8th chapter of the book of Romans, verse 1, I've heard this quoted so many times, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But that's not all there is to that. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is condemnation to those that are not walking after the Spirit of God. Now, that word after, there is a latitude given there. Amen. We walk after the Spirit. There's times in our quest of God, in our walking, we may find ourselves off the path. We may have walked where God wasn't. The only matter of turning around, backing up, getting right. But our hearts isn't condemned over a, a, a hunger for God. And the Bible says, follow after the Spirit. Now, the word here that I want to center on is the word condemn. In, in the 11th verse of the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. 
and men that caught her have brought her to Jesus. And they said, the law of Moses said we're to stone her to death. Now, what do you say about it? The Bible said he wrote in the sand. Then he made this declaration, let him that is without sin cast the first rock. All of these accusers left. Then Jesus asked her where they were. And they said, she answered, they didn't have any. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And in this 8th chapter of the book of Romans, that word is used again. It said, there is therefore now no condemnation. And it is that word that I, I want to settle on tonight. Now the word condemn means to damn, to sentence, to judge against. There is not that to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now, he that believeth in, and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 and 16. God sent his own son not to condemn or damn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Then in Luke 6, 37, condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. That word, it means to damn to judge against, to sentence. Now, condemnation has only two sources from which it can come. That is sin, sin that you refuse to repent of, or the other from the devil. Now, if you have sin in your life that you refuse to forsake, that you refuse to confess, then that sin will condemn you. It will damn you. It will destroy you. You cannot, you cannot, cannot keep sin in your life unconfessed. The Bible said if you confess your sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive that sin. But if you refuse to confess and forsake, then that sin will damn you. You can mark that down. That sin that you refuse to deal with in your life will damn you. Sin carries with it its own seeds of destruction. If you have the sin of unbelief, then you're damned already according to the word of God. He that believeth not shall be damned is the verdict of the word of God. And when we don't believe God, now the devil is the accuser or the condemner of the brethren. He's always trying to bring us into a state of condemnation. He knows the Bible. He quotes the scriptures when he preaches the Bible, you're in trouble if you listen to him. But he'll take the scripture and twist them. He knows that if he can bring you into a state of condemnation where your heart condemns you, then your faith is destroyed. Because the Bible said, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. But if we're in a state of condemnation, then we cannot believe God. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. You can't have any faith in getting the prayer answered. If you allow sin to remain unconfessed in your heart, or if you listen to the devil. Now, the devil constantly strives to bring us under condemnation, for he knows what I just told you, that if your heart condemns you, then your faith is destroyed. You don't have the confidence to lay hold of God and to believe God for the needs of your life. And so it is a devil's business to keep us in a state of condemnation. That's not the will of God. God has made provision for you and I to have a victorious life. It is the purpose and the will of God that we be overcoming Christians in this life and so God isn't out to damn us or to judge against us. It is our sin that brings that or a lie of the devil. Now there's therefore no condemnation to those who, who are in Christ who walk after the Spirit. Now that just simply says we must believe in the grace of God. We must believe. Not a human in this audience tonight that is perfect as we walk with God there's failures in their life. There's constantly a revelation from God leading us into a deeper and a fuller life. 
And it isn't come to damn us. God has come to give us a victory for us to overcome. Many times we preach, and I, I think that we fail to note that we're not just talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about being in a place that we can believe God, where God can use our lives. There's a lot of Christians being defeated in their prayer life over this thing of condemnation. If you're a Christian and you're living in a state of condemnation, then you're either living in a state of willful disobedience or else a devil is lying to you. In either case, you need the victory. You need God to help you to come out of that. God never intended for us to live our life thinking about something that happened in the past. When we confess our sin, God forgives our sin, and we need to go on. I cannot undo what I've done, but I can forget what I've done because I know that God has forgiven. You know, I've dealt with people along this line that they, they have something, some sin they committed, and they'll bring that to an altar. They'll pray. I've talked to them. They seemingly have the victory. But the first time the enemy comes, they're right back where they are. They allow him to constantly dig things up of the past. There's no way that a greater way to be defeated than to allow that enemy to dig up things that the blood has already washed away. Number one, you disgrace the blood of Jesus Christ when you dig up something that God has forgiven you of. When we're always allowing the devil to bring back up things that we've already confessed and been cleansed of, we belittle the blood of Christ and the grace of God. Amen. The blood doesn't cover sin. It washes sin away. Amen. When I came to Christ to be saved 27 years old, when I met Christ, and that blood washed 27 years of sin. I stood there that night after being born again of the Spirit of God. I stood in that altar as if I'd never sinned in my life. Not one thing to that point would ever be remembered against me again. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, 27 years I'd been living for the devil. Amen. I wasn't just a sinner. I'd become sin. Now that's all gone. I stood there. Little boy, seven years old, he and I were the only two that got saved that night. He just knew he needed to be saved, didn't know what sin was. I didn't know anything but sin, but when we stood up, I'm as clean as he is. Thank God, it's as if I have never sinned. That's the grace of God. And to allow the devil to reach into that and bring that back disgraces God. No wonder our hearts is in a state of of condemnation. We allow that thing to come up. I have saw people that something, I don't know whether they believe that God couldn't forgive that or what. Times they seemingly have the victory. Then here it comes again. They're right back where they started. The enemy is able to plow them under. But I want to tell you something. And if you don't remember anything else this preacher says tonight, the Holy Ghost does not come to condemn us. Oh, I'm glad to tell you. I don't care what was in your life when you walked into this building tonight. You came here in the will of God. And no matter what your sin was when you came in, you come here if you're a sinner or you've sinned against God. I want to tell you the Holy Ghost is not here to damn you tonight. He is here to deal with you. He's here to talk with you. He is here to convict you. And he always brings the blood of Jesus. Thank God. Anytime the Holy Spirit comes to deal with you about your sin, he's not here to push you down. He's not here to damn you. He's not here to destroy you. He's here to convict or convince you that you're wrong. He's here to tell you that what you've done is not right, but he's got the answer for the cleansing of that situation. He comes with the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that's one of the greatest truths that ever get quickened to my spirit 
was that God didn't try to get rid of me. Thank God. I raised a couple of children. Amen. I'm telling you, there wasn't. I don't know of anything they could have done that would have caused me to get rid of them. I told them all their life, I'm your best friend. Me and your mother, we're the best friends you got. We're your friend when everything's all right. We're your friends in trouble. Don't you go down the street trying to talk to a neighbor. Don't you go to some church member. You come here. Amen. I'm your friend. If you're in trouble, I'm going to be there with you. That's what the Holy Ghost is saying. He's not my enemy. He's the best friend I ever had. And when I've done wrong and he deals with my heart, he deals with it that I may be right to get rid of the things in my life that would hinder God from working through me. He doesn't damn. He convicts. The word convict comes from the word convince. It means to tell a fruit or to reprove. It means to bring me to a place that I can get that cleared up. If I'll follow the instructions, if I'll confess, then he'll wash it away. And when he does, if I don't commit that again, I don't ever have to remember that again. God has took it away from me. As far as the east is from the west, he has forgiven me. Now I must forgive myself. I must not allow that to be brought back upon me. Now, there's a lot of difference between, between being convinced of something and being damned for something. Can you say amen? I said there's a lot of difference in being convinced that I'm wrong than being damned for being wrong. And the Holy Spirit doesn't damn me. He comes to convict or convince. And he always has with him the blood of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Ghost convinces of sin, he brings that blood to cleanse. Glory to God. Oh, there's no condemnation to the heart of those that walk not after flesh but after the Spirit. We can come to God. Amen. When we come, Jesus, when they ask him to teach them to pray, he said to them, You pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, this day our daily bread. And then he said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And when we come with that kind of an attitude, when we come with that attitude of forgiveness and wanting forgiveness for whatever you can be sure that in that moment, whatever stands between me and God, between the Lord hearing my prayer and answering my prayer, is gone with confidence then. I can approach the throne of grace. I can come to God boldly in that moment. Thank God. Now Hebrews 5.14 says that the real sign of maturity is the ability to discern between good and evil. It says in Hebrews 5, 14, that strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, who by reason of exercise in their spiritual senses, they're able to discern between good and evil. Now, you know and I know that talking about discerning between good and evil, he's not just talking about getting drunk, cursing, stealing. I knew that's wrong long before I ever got saved. I never did that kind of a wrong uh, in my life that I didn't know that it was wrong. Unsaved, I knew that was wrong. But he said the mark of a mature person is the ability to know what's right and what's wrong, know what spirit is operating, know whether it's a flesh or know whether it's God. Now, this being so, that the mark of a mature person is the ability to know. And as we move on with God, then that ability grows with it so that we recognize things that when we first got saved that we saw nothing wrong with may become terribly wrong as we grow close to God. Now, it's the opposite. I see Christians 
when they first got saved, amen, great conviction, you had never found them down there in one of those theaters watching that trash of violence and filth and sex. But now tonight, many of them are down there and they call that maturity. No, that's being lost. That's losing out with God. As I walk with God, I become more sensitive to the spirit world and things that I thought may have been all right will become wrong. As I grow, that ability to discern, to know what God's plea is with and what He isn't is enlarged. The Holy Ghost, as we grow in grace, will constantly be convincing us of things that are displeasing to God that we never recognized as being wrong in the beginning. Now, this is a truth you don't hear much of. You can listen to preaching. You can listen to that television. You can listen to the radio. You won't hear a whole lot of this. But I'm going to tell you, there is no other way out but this. As we grow in the grace of God, the Holy Spirit is constantly dealing with our hearts. And what was perfectly all right yesterday may not be all right tomorrow. It wasn't all right with God yesterday, but He saw you wasn't mature enough to see what He's talking about. Amen. You wasn't mature for God, enough for God to deal with your heart. Now, this doesn't mean that we're to go back to the altar and get saved, nor does it mean that we're not filled with the Holy Ghost when God begins to deal with us in this life. Now, if I turn back, you understand, if I turn Turn back and pick up something that God has delivered me from, then I've opened myself up to even be demon possessed, folks. Amen. But as I walk on with God in a straight line, if I continue in the grace of God, then the Holy Spirit is constantly dealing with my heart, revealing to me things in this life that God isn't pleased with. I, I'm not aware of that till God deals with it. But it is a sign of growth. It doesn't mean that when God shows me that there's something in this heart that He's not pleased with, uh, that, that I'm lost or that I'm not filled with the Holy Ghost. It just means that God wants to enlarge the vessel. If there's an increase of Christ in your life, then something in us has to become the burnt offering. God will deal with something in that life that's not of Himself, and He will take the place of that if we'll let Him. This is the way growth comes in the Christian life. It is as I walk in the sanctifying process of God. Amen. You see, we sometimes... I, I, I have been disturbed no end. Uh, Brother Briggs had one of the group of boys, I don't know which one, uh, a Sunday school lesson, begin to quiz them about what we believe. And uh, they, they were woefully ignorant on the very fundamentals of what we believe and sitting here. I, that's a tragedy of our time. Amen. That you can just flow through and not the word of the Lord take a hold of you so that you know what you believe and are able to stand as God would have us to stand. But you see, this, this truth, this theological fact of how the Christian grows, that sanctification is the process. You see, we, we must understand why man has to be born again when man sinned. When he sinned in that garden, he died. That is, his spirit died toward God. God is a spirit. God is not soul, so God's not the father of my soul. God is spirit. God is not body, so he didn't beget my body. He created my body. God is spirit. And in that sense alone is God our Father, you see. When man sinned, his spirit died, and he become a soulish being that God could not communicate or have any fellowship with. In the temptation, the first Adam failed and died toward God. So man had to be born again. And the new birth is, 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 is that union restored between the human spirit and God. It is the spirit of man made alive and union restored. And when it's restored, then there's a process of growth. Amen. And that growth is as God leads you and deals with you. The Holy Ghost is constantly leading you on toward the image of Christ. And to do that, he must deal with those things in your life that's not God. So Paul says in the book of Ephesians, 
Amen. He says along about verse 21, 22, he said, put off the old man, talking to the born again believer. That is corrupt. And he begins to name what you put away, lying and deceitful lust. But then verse 24, he said, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now you see what one is, you see what the other is, and the Holy Spirit's always dealing with the works of the old and the fruit of the new. That I put off the one, I put on the other, and that's the progress toward the image of Christ. And the process of growth is God is always dealing with you in perfecting you. Not condemning, not damning, but perfecting. Amen. We are not to be condemned or damned or feel like we're not saved when God deals with it. You sit here, you hear the preaching of the Word of God. It stabs your heart. You find you're guilty in that area. That doesn't mean you're lost. It doesn't mean you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. This is rather that going on to perfection spoken of in Hebrews 6 and 1. This should not bring condemnation but rejoicing that I've arrived at a place in my life that God sees I can handle a little more of the Spirit work. Now, if what he's dealing with in my life is something God has already dealt with me about and have been delivered of, then I've turned backward. I've opened myself up to hell. I've opened up. You see, being born again is something real. There ain't no devils in that, folks. You have to hear that. I have to say that over and over. And you, you, you hear people talking about Christian being demon possessed. You need to run from that. You need to run. There are no pigs in this parlor. I can tell you that. And when you begin to hear that, and it's a sound that's going, this kingdom theology, many of them are not as extreme as others, but that's a part of it. they are always got demons in Christians. Amen. They take away the responsibility of my action. God deals with me. I have no devil there. If there's something wrong that God puts his finger on, that's the flesh. And he said, I have to crucify that. I don't run around looking for somebody to lay hands on me and cast that out. You, you call the flesh the devil, then try to cast it out. It doesn't work that way. Then the, then the soul says, I'm not responsible. God never delivered me. That's the lie that's being told. It's a flesh. It isn't a devil. When God deals with it and says, that's wrong, then I'm to crucify that. He give me the Holy Spirit to deal with that with. Amen. I said, he give me the Holy Spirit. He said, if I walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lusts and the desires of the flesh. Amen. Jesus said, he that bear fruit, God will purge, that he'll bring forth more fruit. The convicting of the Holy Ghost is that purging. That's how it happens. You're being fruitful. You're winning souls. And all of a sudden, God deals with your heart. And you see something there that you never saw. Why, the devil pounced on that and tried to condemn you. But it's just God wants to push you a little further along this spiritual road. Amen. A more mature Christian, full of God, walking more in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is God's way of victory. Now, the way of victory is always the same. Once the Holy Ghost has come and convinced or convicted, the way of the victory becomes very simple. Amen. becomes very simple. Always remember, if I overcome in any area, if I really overcome, I stay in fellowship with God with repentance. Amen. Some area, there may be some uh, spirit of jealousy or something you're wrestling with. And you, you, the minute you let it rise up, you're, uh, the, you, you, you've, you know you've been wrong. You confess, you repent, and you pray. It may come back. Uh, you know, you may not have got the total victory, and the thing stab at you again. But you really win the victory. Once that thing has been overcome, you will never face it again unless you backslide. Amen. Thirty-something years ago, 38, 39 years ago, God delivered me from tobacco. I've hated it ever since. Forty years ago, He delivered me from alcohol. I've hated it ever since. I've never had no temptation with that again. Never. Amen. And whatever it is, lying or whatever, when God delivers you, you will not have any problem with that again unless you backslide. 
But if you turn back to what God's delivered you from, that's a different story. But if you're walking on and you refuse to turn back to that world that God has brought you out of, as that revelation comes and he convinces you and convicts you that you ha have sinned, that, that there's something here that's, that God is not pleased with, then the victory is simple. He said, confess your sins and shortcoming and God will forgive. Confess your sin and God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Now we take a sinner, raw sinner in an altar and quote that to him. That won't work, folks. Heartfelt confession is a part of that repentance, but there has to be a deep repentance of turning from on the part of that sinner. We, we fill the church with tears because we threw the message of repentance out. Repentance, the word literally means to change your mind, change, turn away from. And to tell a sinner that's been a sinner all of his life to confess his sin, you can't do that. I knelt there 27 years old. I'd have been there for the next 27 years trying to confess all that I'd done in those years. That don't work. I repented. I turned. I confessed I'm a sinner. And he saved me. But now... Now, as a Christian, it's a different story. When I was a sinner, being forgiven wasn't the answer. Being born again was the answer. But now I'm a child of God, and I can have forgiveness. If I confess, He will forgive. I said, if I confess. Now, we must believe then that God forgives. That's the key. No matter what. As long as the Lord deals with your heart, you fail him, he deals with you about something, as long as he deals with your heart, that means he'll forgive you. He doesn't toy with emotions. No, sir. God doesn't toy and play with the emotions of the human. If God deals with you and you feel that that's wrong, if you'll confess that, he will forgive it. I must believe in the forgiveness of God. Oh, that's where the victory is. Thank God I stand tall then. Amen. Man point his finger. Man may <clears throat> never forgive. I wrong you and I come to you. I ask <clears throat> God to forgive me. And I come to you and ask you to forgive me. And you say, well, that's easy for you to say and you may not forgive, but you're the one in trouble, not me. Thank God he has forgiven. You should have. But whether you do or not, it's not going to interfere with what God's done in my life. So I believe in God's forgiveness. And so because I believe in the forgiveness of God, I forgive myself. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Most folks trouble, they won't forgive themselves. Always bringing it up. Or letting the devil bring it up. There's a lot of things in life you may wish you hadn't done. I wish I'd have got saved when I was seven. I didn't. I'm just glad he saved me when I was 27. I can't go back. I can't undo anything. But it's gone. Thank God. No more to be remembered. Hallelujah. Amen. Things happen. And in a moment, you let your temper flare up. You're, you're, you're cross with somebody. And the Holy Spirit said, that's not right. You say, forgive me, Lord. And say to that human, I was wrong. Forgive me. It's over with. No more laying awake at night wishing you hadn't done it. No need in wishing that. You did it. Years and years ago, we built that nursing home right over here. We, we built that. Donnie, he is working for me with you. The young man leading the singing tonight, he is working for me out in the office and Oh, we was having the time. I had the fire crew one night, midnight, babysat with the thing all night long. It is just one thing after another. And I come in the office one morning. He said, Brother Pastor, do you believe that's the will of God? And I took him by the hand and I said, I want you to come with me. I want to show you something. And I walked him out on the parking lot and we're facing that big old nursing home over there. I said, what is that, son? He said, that's that nursing home. 
I said, it don't make any difference whether it's the will of God now or not. I said, we got to eat it or do something else with it. Amen. What, what I've done back there may not have been the will of God, but that's gone. I can't do anything about it. I say, Father, forgive me. Cover me with the blood. Wash me with the blood. I believe it happened. I forgive myself. I forget it. You bring it up. I'll tell you that's over with. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Condemnation is bondage. It'll bring defeat. I said, it'll bring defeat. Condemnation will defeat you. You can't stand that. I've watched it press, press, press. Amen. All the while, that becomes a sin itself, you see, because you're making God a liar. Amen. You're making God a liar. And he, he, he doesn't. You can get in your little self-pity over that condemnation. God will just tell you stay there and you'll go to hell. You can get out of it if you want to. There is no place for that. Amen. I can tell you there is no place for that. God has made a way for victory. And if you will follow that path, if you will confess, he'll forgive. When he forgives, he forgets. You forgive, you forget. Walk on. Hallelujah. I said walk on. Thank God. God, there's victory in Jesus tonight. Church, everything isn't a matter of heaven and hell. It's a devil. Every time you fail, he wants to make you lost. That isn't so anymore than when that boy, that girl of yours wrong. You had to get that paddle out. Amen. And work him over. Yesterday when the storm, day before yesterday, whenever it was, the storm was coming through, I guess, yesterday. Well, it looked like we was going to get it. and We shut the place down and... Then it didn't come, so we opened it back up. And when Jim come, he brought his little boy. And in that bag he had, he had this little bitty board, just about that long. And I said to that boy, what's that board? He said, board. He, did. <laughs> he knew what that board is about. But you know what he knew? He knew even here at a year old that just because his dad had to dust him off every now and then, that his dad still loved him. That he wasn't doing away with him. God says, if he loves you, he's going to chasten you. If you're not chasing, you're illegitimate. You don't belong to him. And when God spanks you, just remember, he loves you. He's not throwing you out. Hallelujah to God. Condemned or convinced, there's a big difference. There's a big difference devil wants to damn me but the Holy Ghost wants to convince me that there's a way out you are wrong he's saying but here's the blood thank God oh hallelujah dare to confess it he says and I'll forgive it condemned are convinced God is saying to you I've made a way of escape don't live under a state of defeat. Don't live under a state of defeat. Don't let that enemy keep you beaten and battered and lying to you. When your heart smites you, and God deals with something in that life. He's meaning for you to get rid of it. And there's a power in you to overcome it. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world prayer meeting one morning I was in that corner praying and the spirit of the Lord dealing with me about this very thinking and he said to me when I deal with anything in your life I mean for you to get rid of it I don't mean tomorrow I mean for you to get rid of it when I deal with you in your heart I have given you the power to overcome it or I never would have put my finger on it. I knew you were at a point where you could handle it. I never would have dealt with you. Now, I mean for you to get rid of it. You sitting here tonight. If God has been dealing with you about something you've tolerated, you really didn't know whether it's wrong, but God's dealing with you about it. He's saying to you, I've made a way of escape. I've made a way of escape. I've given you the power to overcome and that's how you grow death death the something of the old nature resurrection of something of Christ and the process is endless 
until we awake in his likeness. Stand with me here.